Some old research found that black box tests achieved less than 33% coverage of the lines of the program. It simply missed two-thirds of the program. Much of the missed code was error handling. Now, scenario testing isn't coverage focused. It's not surprising to discover that testing only with scenarios would miss a lot of code. You can do some assessment of coverage with scenarios if you decide to. You could trace scenario tests against specification items or lists of features or many other attributes of the program that you can see and tell whether you test it or not. But scenario testing isn't your only test technique. There are a lot of faster, simpler, cheaper tests than scenarios that you can use to help you fill in your gaps in any type of coverage. An important risk of scenario testing involves the time and money it takes to make scenarios reusable. The greatest power of a scenario lies in its ability to expose design flaws or design disagreements. Most scenario tests are going to teach you most of the things you're going to learn about the design the first time you run the test. So why bother making it reusable? It's not like it's free. It's going to cost you money to write everything down. It's going to cost you more money to automate the test. And then as the program changes, it's going to cost you even more money to do maintenance. If the main value of the scenario is to teach you something about the design, you've learned it. You're not going to learn much else by rerunning the test every week. So don't waste the money. Well, that's almost the end of the lecture on scenarios. There's just one more point to make. Just like risk-based testing is a collection of related techniques, so is scenario testing. Take the 17 lines of analysis that I laid out. You could describe each of them as a distinct test technique. They have some things in common. That's what brings them together as a family of scenario tests. But now it's time to step back and consider how these different families of tests fit together. So far, we've studied four techniques in some detail. And I've quickly sketched another 70 or so. So how should a tester combine a variety of techniques to create a strong testing strategy? So let me start by contrasting two techniques. Scenario tests have to be credible, but risk-based tests don't. Risk-based tests are optimized to expose bugs, but scenario tests aren't. Scenario tests are designed to motivate key stakeholders, but risk-based tests aren't. When you find a bug with a risk-based test, it's not unusual to do follow-up testing to come up with scenarios that demonstrate the bug in a more credible, more motivating way. In bug advocacy, we talked about this as externalizing the bug. Tests often differ obviously in their strengths. It's a little harder to characterize their weaknesses. Think about risk-based tests, for example. They're designed to be powerful, but that doesn't mean that they're designed not to be credible. We want every test to be credible. But while it would be good for a risk-based test to be credible, it doesn't have to be. Power is the core aspect of risk-based testing. A risk-based test that isn't powerful, it's not a good risk-based test. Credibility is a core attribute of a scenario test. A scenario that isn't credible is a crappy scenario. Every technique has its own core attributes. The 18 attributes that I list here characterize many of the most important differences among the techniques. So now I'm going to walk through the different attributes. And as usual in this survey course, when we hit a long list, I'm going to cover some of these in a bit of detail and just skim the rest. You can get more details from the paper on what makes a good test case. So let's start with power. Power is the ability of a test to expose bugs. Now finding a bug doesn't make a test powerful. Even a weak test can find an obvious bug. And not finding a bug doesn't make a test weak. If there's no bug to find, the most powerful test in the world won't find it. Often the best way to think about the power of a test, or about any of these attributes, is by comparison. This test is more powerful than that one. Another way to think about the power of a test is to ask how the test could be modified to make it more powerful or less powerful. So if I ask you why you think this test is powerful or credible or motivating, organize your answer around a comparison. Compare with another test or compare with a hypothetical variation on this test that makes it more or less of that attribute. When you do regression testing, you reuse old tests. Regression tests are often automated. You run the test, you check the results against the results you got last time. But if the program's design changes, its display and its output are going to change naturally. So next time you run the test, the program works correctly, but the test tool says, hey, there's a problem, because it's different from what it was last time. 
Well, that's a false alarm. False alarms lack validity. One of the reasons that I dislike automated black box regression tests is the too high ratio between false alarms and actual bugs found. Validity is not a strength of this technique. Tests have high value if they're designed to reveal things that are particularly valuable to your stakeholders. I've already talked about credibility. Representativeness is an interesting attribute. Think back to the Get a Job program. Suppose you design a test to look for data corruption any time the user has 65,535 or more records in his database. That's not very likely to happen, but is it impossible? No. Think about Bill's support group. Lots of people, lots of job searches, eventually they're going to go over 65,000 cases. So this is extreme, but it's going to happen. We can see that in the target market. A case can be credible. It's going to happen, but unlikely. It's not representative. The primary strength of equivalence class analysis is non-redundancy. You don't waste your time running lots of similar tests. You test with one representative of the equivalence class. I've already talked about tests that are motivating. I think performability varies on a test-by-test -test basis rather than a technique-by-technique -technique basis. What I mean is that you have to evaluate performability for each test, especially any test you want someone else to perform. Reusability, performability, and maintainability are tightly connected concepts. A test that's hard to perform, that's hard for you to delegate to someone else, that test is hard to reuse. And a test that's hard to maintain is going to become unreusable very quickly. Information value of a test is one of its most important attributes and one of the hardest for inexperienced testers to grasp. When you're about to run a test, ask yourself how much you're really likely to learn from this test. That's its information value. The comment I made about reusing scenarios is all about information value. The first time you run a scenario, it has a high information value, but it teaches you what it's going to teach about the program's design. After that, when you run it, yeah, maybe you're going to find a bug, probably not, but most of the time you're not going to learn anything new about the program. That's low information value. The reason I don't reuse scenarios very often is low information value. The essence of exploratory testing is using whatever techniques are useful right now to maximize the information value of your work. I've talked a lot about coverage and about ease of evaluation. Some techniques make troubleshooting much easier. For example, think about extreme programming. The programmers create unit tests for every function, and they run their suite of unit tests every time they compile the program. When they're programming, they're compiling every few minutes. So they make a change. Within a few minutes, they're going to compile. They're going to run all the unit tests. And if one of the unit tests that used to pass breaks, they know that the change was one of the things that they did over the last 10 minutes. That's great support for troubleshooting. The more stable the program gets, the more complex you should make your tests. That's because the more complex tests offer more power and probably more information value. The more your testing is subject to external review, the more accountable your test designs and practice have to be. Many people think that automated tests are more affordable than manual tests. Done well, that might be true. Automated user-level regression testing is the most common kind of automated testing, and this is often very expensive because of its high maintenance costs. Unless you manage your black box regression very carefully, its affordability can be shockingly poor. Any time you spend on any testing activity is time you can't spend on the other activities. When you assess the value of any test, Part of that assessment asks how much value you could have gotten from other test activities if you did them instead. That's your opportunity cost. Well, it's time to finish today's lecture, so let's review. Early in testing, when the program's unstable, it makes a lot more sense to run simple tests. But as the program gets more stable, it's going to pass those tests. So you want to run more complex tests or tests of harsher values. In terms of the evolution of stability in a program, Use cases illustrate early stage and mid stage testing. Scenarios are better for mid stage and late stage work. Different test techniques emphasize different attributes. A good risk based test is going to be very different from a good scenario. No technique is good for everything. A good test strategy combines techniques so that you have a collection of sets that together have complementary strengths.